Welcome to Tales of Britain and Ireland. This is a podcast telling the stories, legends and folk tales of Britain and Ireland in no particular order. Presented by Graham and coming direct from South Yorkshire, each episode tells a story or selection of stories from all across these islands and throughout their history, followed by a short and decidedly inexpert discussion of the origin and themes of each tale. Hello everyone and welcome back after another one of my trademark extended breaks, which never mean the podcast is ending, they just mean I can't get round to doing episodes as much as I really, really want to. I'm pretty terrible at making things, all told. I'm not going to divot at the start much here, you'll be glad to know, and just get straight on with this episode which I'm delighted to bring to you, but I would like to just go into a little bit what this episode is. This is a compilation story episode about giants, yes, but it developed in an odd sort of way. It was going to be one story I found I was really excited about sharing with you, but that was sort of short and I wanted to weave that into a bigger narrative with some other stories I've been meaning to tell for a while. So then I thought, right, let's do a full-on giant overview episode in the same way that I've covered other topics in the past. But then I sort of realised that Giant was too big a topic for one single episode, and really I'd want a series to give it its due. So I decided to scale back and not do a general overview of the subject of Giants. So now I've ended up with something somewhere in between, not quite a full overview of the topic, but not just completely disparate stories. I've sort of weaved them together slightly, though limiting myself to just a couple of tales from Britain. And then finally on this topic, this episode was still pretty long before releasing it, though I've actually taken a bit back since then. And I got myself on social media and did some polls asking people whether I should split it into two fun-sized giant episodes or just drop one appropriately giant-sized episode. And across all the polls, the answer was... 45% of people wanted it split into two, 55% wanted it to be one big episode, which just meant that I'd learnt I was going to be disappointing somebody, whatever I did. I went with the majority, dropped this giant one, and I know that those of you who wanted two short episodes will be disappointed. I'm so sorry. Guys, the conclusion from all this, I'm going to level with you, is that my process is just shockingly bad. So yeah, that's it. I just thought I'd let you know how I got here. Thank you to everyone who voted in those polls. Thank you to everyone who keeps supporting me and encouraging me in what I know is not an ideal release schedule. And so, without any further ado, let's launch into an episode which could well be entitled Giant's Resurrection. Previously on Tales of Britain and Ireland. And I do mean very previously, like a long time ago. We are talking years here. And in that previously, the story I'm talking about was completely finished, wrapped up like a hard-boiled sweet, so you could be forgiven for not remembering any of it. Don't worry if you've forgotten. And for new listeners, you aren't going to need this in any detail for this episode to make sense. Don't sweat it. It's just kind of really cool if any of you do happen to remember the original story because I have found a sequel I never knew existed. That's cool by my standards, by the way. Considerably lower than most uses of the word cool warrant. So anyway, previously on Tales of Britain and Ireland, I told of exiled Trojan warriors arriving in Britain for the first time to find the island absolutely full, not of people, but of giants. Strange and warped giants. And this might have been a problem even for the mighty and bloodthirsty Trojan warriors, except for two things. Firstly, the giants had been inbreeding for a long time. They were all descended from one family, uh, and some demons. I'm not going to get into that story here, check out the episode on Albina for that. But for centuries, millennia even, they'd all interbred and so were rather reduced. In their form, but also in numbers. They were like those last mammoths on Wrangell Island, not at their best, and only a handful of them remained, which the Trojans handily outnumbered. Second of all, and completely coincidentally, the Trojans had brought with them their very own giant. Corinius, he was called. He came from Africa, and he was a much more human-y giant. If you happen to have the reference point, you'd do well to picture the BFG versus the rest of the giants. Though a much more violent BFG. But 
he looked more like a human, and because the giants were ugly, we know they're evil, and because Corinius looks like a guy, he is good. That's how it works. People's morality is easily identifiable through socially agreed beauty standards that everyone can observe. What a complicated world we would be living in if that was not the case. So they arrive on the island, and then this happens. Roll the clip. They united to make their final stand against the human invaders. They were led by Gog Magog, most fearsome of all, and it wasn't long before the giants and the Trojans were engaged in battle. The giants wielded trees like clubs and smashed the bodies of the humans aside like straw. The fighting was bloody and fierce. But the giants, though ferocious, were in the end no match for the more numerous, disciplined, and equally ferocious forces of the Trojans. Though many, many more Trojans died, by the end of the day of the giant attack, the bodies of 23 giants lay as a feast for the crows. And then a little bit after that in the episode... Gog Magog's body fell onto the jagged rocks below, and there it was smashed to pieces and the waves turned red with his blood, washing away the last living trace of Albina from the land. Listening to that back, I noticed I talked a bit slower back then. But anyway, the point is that the giants, they were defeated, and Gog Magog, the very last and biggest of them, he had his body smashed to pieces, and then the narrative camera moved away and stayed with the Trojans, who went on to establish London and all that good stuff. The giants were gone from the land, the story says. But that wasn't really the case. For a start, there was that one with the Trojans, but even if we ignore him... Though the Trojans and subsequent chroniclers might have trumpeted it around that Gog Magog was the last of the giants, well, subsequent history doesn't quite bear that out. For in the years after the Trojan invasion, giants seemed to crop up a lot for those supposedly disappeared. It's true that this was no longer a land solely of giants, but they lingered long. Anyway, back to this story. When I shifted that narrative camera away from the broken up corpse of Gog Magog, perhaps that was an error. Perhaps I should have stuck around. For the next day, just before dawn, as the darkness grew blue, on the rocky shore lay the ruined giant torso. One arm hanging off, all the other limbs and the head nowhere to be seen. It was sodden through, a great heavy lump of sea salt wetted flesh smeared with blood and sand entangled in weed. Two hungry early morning gulls descended from the sky onto this prize. Yellow beaks stabbed and ripped eagerly, the birds threw back their heads, gulping down great pieces of Gog Magog. There came a flicker in the air in that half-light, and the lifeless torso appeared to twitch. Surely some air escaping from the ruined lungs. Nevertheless, there was the sound of wing beats and startled cries from the gulls. Further along the shore, if one peered through the darkness... You might just make out a five-legged something making its way over the rocks, dragging. Was that a huge tail behind it? Some sort of terrible crab slowly crawling towards the torso. A great wave crashed over the rocks, and when it washed back out, it left there a mighty leg on the shore, as large as an oak, a leg that had been torn from the giant's body. There came again that flicker, that shiver in the air. And if there had been anyone there to hear it, they might have imagined that on the wind they heard a faint voice whispering sibilant sounds low and unintelligibly. And that great detached limb twitched. <laughs> 
Life, or at least its semblance, sparked in the torso now. There came the smell of ozone, as the torso was animated by shock after shock, and a close observer may have noticed that the flesh of that disjointed, broken arm was knotting together with the shoulder, until the joint was fully formed once again. And now that gigantic hand reached around blindly, gripping onto jagged rocks and slowly dragging the body behind it as it made its way towards the washed up leg. From up in the sky there came the terrified shriek of a gull as its last meal tried to work itself up and out, lumps of chewed, bespittled giant flesh tearing the poor creature's throat up from the inside. Some more time passed, and as the sun came up over the horizon, the dead giant placed his head back on his shoulders, opened his eyes, and from his mouth issued forth a great hellish fire. And that, that was basically a prologue. We will be returning to it later. But now for some stories. Now before getting into today's stories, I feel the need to go off a little on the the social role and the biological evolutionary role of giants. Because as I research giant legends, it just kind of obsessed me a little. Incidentally, in a bit of an aside, I often thought giant was a reductive name. Giants because they were big. But I was completely wrong. Etymologically speaking, the word giant, meaning big, is derived from the name of the giants, not the other way around. So actually perfectly reasonable to call them that. And they were so notable that that word became our generic term for something large. For their size is their most defining feature. Without it, they'd kind of just be, well, humans. Bloodthirsty humans who really like to eat creatures smaller than them, who covet gold, sometimes but not always, stupid and violent and permanently hungry. So yeah, humans. Like us, only bigger. Which is better, as I've been reliably informed. And you might think that given this, the world would belong to them, not to humans. And yet giants' numbers are low, even in the past when they were more common. Just a few isolated giants, often solitary or living in pairs. Whereas humanity has the bulk of the globe. And I speculate this is because giants have grown too big for a world that is not scaled for them. There are no trees to shelter under from sun or storm. No simple spring enough to quench their thirst. No animal with a pelt big enough to wrap themselves in. These, the basic trappings of civilization, are so much harder for a giant. In the Mabinogion episodes, I've talked about how the giant Bendigedfran had never been in a house, because to build a house for a giant is a huge undertaking, and not just on a human scale, I mean, but even for a giant. No simple single tree can make the beam of a giant's house. Something much more complicated is required, perhaps why they live so often in vast caves, the numbers of which are limited. All the weird bits of animals on which most of our early technology was based are scaled well for humans and terribly for giants. Add to that that the needs of even a few giants will rapidly exhaust the land all about, so forming sizeable giant communities becomes difficult, and without those kind of communities, labour being efficiently divided becomes hard and the problem compounds itself. Their society cannot develop like ours. So while humans advanced in a world that seems comparatively built for them, giants, however similar they are to us, cannot take such advantage. And so we find them thus, rare, solitary, and increasingly preyed upon by rapaciously invasive species, just like themselves, but with the surprising advantage of being smaller, with technology and numbers ever on their side. (laughs) 
And when I was thinking this through, I realised that a similar evolutionary pressure is precisely what generates those dwarf, insular varieties of animal species. You know, the ones that are just like big animals but smaller due to resource constraints. Like how there used to be these little elephants on Sicily that were dog size and look just so cute. Fully grown elephants, but tiny. Little tusks and little big ears. I just want to smoosh them up so. Just perhaps, humans are the tiny, cute, miniature elephants of giants. With our cute little smooshable faces. So yes, if you too were troubled with thoughts of why don't the giants run the world? Now, you've got my insights into it. Very valuable indeed. Anyway, this brings me to a point that a giant on a small island would be even more resource pressured. And yet, after the Trojan invasion, it was the giants on the outlying islands who were perhaps best placed to avoid their attention. And so it is perhaps not too surprising that there comes a story of giants from an island as remote from the Trojans' landing point at Totnes as it is possible to be in the current day United Kingdom. I speak of the island of Unst, today the most northerly inhabited island in the UK, historically far more culturally bound to Norway than to England, than even to Scotland. But this story is set well before that time, well before the spread of humanity, when Unst was completely without people. And this relatively small island, 12 miles long, 5 miles wide, give or take, could be the home of not one, but two giants. They both dwelt in the very north of the island, looking out into the Norwegian Sea, their territories separated by a firth, that is an inlet. On the eastern side of the island lived the giant Hermann, an old name indeed it would appear, and on the western side, the giant Saxi. If you're wondering by the way if that name has any relation to the Saxavord spaceport on Unst, yes, an actual spaceport, then the answer is yes. Well, actually, The spaceport is named after a hill that's named after the giant. Citation needed on that last point, but let's assume it's named after the giant, though the giant had long since ceased to inhabit the island when the spaceport was built. And, oddly enough, the spaceport is actually nowhere near the hill that it's named after. Except that they're both on Unst, which is bizarre. Anyway, while that's very interesting, back to the past. Now it should perhaps have been an easy life for the giants. The island was big enough to comfortably accommodate both of them. They could be well fed from the fishes of the sea and on the large colonies of seabirds found on the rocky crags and cliff tops. And when they were careful, they could take more sparingly from the cattle who grazed the flat land in the south of the island. But it was not such an easy and pleasant life for them, as in the way of far too many neighbours, they loathed one another. And not having a great deal to do, the basics of life being easy, this mutual hatred occupied a great deal of their time. The difference was one of temperament and character. Saxe was a loud, active kind of fellow, who liked to kill and eat, and was on good terms with the wild spirits of the ocean and the raging storm fiends that buffeted the exposed island, screaming into them with delight. Herman, on the other hand, was not like that at all. No, he was quiet and peaceable, sensitive. He wrote poetry and recited it to the moon and to the dancing northern lights when he wasn't gazing at their beauty in wonder, an eight-gallant tear never far away from his huge eye. Yes, this duality of giants came in the two immutable flavours of person that have existed since time immemorial, just as they do now. You know, the jock and the nerd. The two genders. The respective landscapes the giants dwelt in seemed to embody their personalities. Saxe's side of the island was all jagged rocks, jutting crags and treacherous bogs, while Herman's side was soft hillocks gently undulating, awash with colourful flowers, oft times wrapped in an enchanting, but not creepy, mist. Both much as they are to this very day. Spaceports aside. Regardless, they hated one another. Being giants, they naturally resorted to the usual method of giant combat. That is, 
throwing rocks at one another, with unerring inaccuracy it seemed. Perhaps they didn't really want to hit, hated each other, but in some ways feared loneliness more. But they threw the rocks anyway, and the sides of the hills and the little inlet itself were replete with boulders. Despite his poetical soul, our nerd gave every bit as good as the jock, both in ferocity and incompetence of aim. But the fact that they both survived isn't a hint that some enemies to lovers storyline is coming along here, I'm afraid. The bitter rivals aren't going to finally admit their love when it turns out there's only a single giant bed in the giant inn they've booked, forcing them to reassess the intensity of their emotions and eventually give in to their gigantic passions. This is not book talk. Now, the biggest argument they'd had to date had been over the use of a kettle. And by a kettle, I mean a kind of big basin on the rocks into which water rises from below and swirls around and bubbles and somehow also heats up. And the kettle was on Saxe's side of the cliffs. Herman had managed to catch himself a poor unfortunate whale and after smacking it around a bit, was all ready to cook it up but whatever passed for his usual giant cooking method wasn't up to the task. So he called over in his big booming giant voice to Saxe, a voice that, of course, was perfectly normal to both of them, asking if he could borrow the kettle to cook up some whale. Saxe, quite reasonably in my opinion, replied back in his big booming normal voice something along the lines of, you can use it as long as I can have half of the whale. But, despite his, quote, sensitive nature, Herman boomed back in his perfectly normal voice, I'd rather tear and eat it raw than give half away to you. Which, wow, what a dick. With only my limited knowledge of the situation, I now know who I feel better inclined to. No further details are forthcoming about how the whale was eaten, how much was wasted or whatever, but this moment of potential reconciliation passed, and the two were enemies forever more. And so things went on for who knows how many years, a low-level constant resentment that fuelled them both but never actually led to all-out warfare. Life continued much as it ever had for the two giants, right up until the day that she arrived. Now you might expect her to be a female giant. There are in fact other tales of female giants living on Unz, but tragically for Herman and Saxe, not at this time. But no, she was not a female giant, nor was she a human. Instead, she was one of the sea folk, of which there are a great many varieties in those vast cold northern seas. There's fin folk and selkies and sea trows, but she was simply a mermaid. A mermaid who they first spotted combing her sea-wet green hair on the Utster, the little rock in the sea just off the northern shore of Unst. Today, it is the very northern tip of the UK. John O'Groats has nothing on this. And beyond that rock lies only sea, the very edge of the giant's world. There she was, all fish's tail and naked bosom, and beautiful, of course beautiful, But beauty standards vary so much, what that means is open to interpretation, but it's enough to understand that she drew the amorous intentions of both giants to her. Now yes, I understand you have questions. I have questions too. Practical questions about fish tails and relative sizes. But I think that, should it have ever been in any doubt, over the last 30 years or so, the internet and certain specialist art sites, particularly, have taught us all well enough that should sentient creatures of radically different morphologies and scale to, well certainly to humans, exist, and should they correspond even very roughly to certain aspects of human biology, well, we as a species would have absolutely no problems falling in wild, crazy lust with them, and probably even in love too completely in the face of any logistical challenges to the successful act of mere coitus these disparate shapes and sizes would provide. Life finds a way. And that seems to apply just as much to giants as to humans, 
because the two became obsessed with this mermaid, who may or may not have been giant proportioned, but in any case certainly had a great beautiful fish's tail, which she sunned on the rock, the dazzling iridescence catching the attention of both the poetical soul of Herman and the more animalistic urges of Saxe. Or at least, that's probably how Herman might have it. Though in reality, at heart, they were pretty similar urges. Now, getting into the mind of the mermaid here is tricky. We can see by her actions that she certainly was no fan of Eva Souter, but perhaps she liked the attention, maybe she enjoyed the chaos it caused. Could be she was just bored. But whatever her motivation, she certainly led both giants on. By the bright moonlit night, she would swim under the cliffs of the promontory where Herman dwelt and sing beautiful songs in the glimmering starlight. Songs that stirred his soul and mind and made his longing for her fiercer. And, mistakenly, and by her design rather than innocent accident, mistakenly gave him the impression that his feelings might be returned. Perhaps this unlikely pairing could work out. But with Herman up all night, he slept during the day, at which time, well... Then she went to the east, to Saxe's bit of the island, and made for him a luder, cruder display that riled him right up, and gave him too every signal that his interest was reciprocated and then some. Don't ask when she slept, by the way. Maybe mermaids don't sleep. Maybe she did this on alternate days. Maybe she was just good at mixing her sleep cycle up to be highly variable. You know, I'm writing this at half four in the morning, I have to get up at seven, but I reckon I'll be in bed by six tomorrow evening, so such a sleep cycle can definitely be done. That's not too relevant. The point is that over the course of several weeks, she wooed them. Not that much wooing was required, but she planted firmly in the mind of each giant that him and her were to have some sort of cross-species future. A brief wild dalliance, or a long future with half-giant, half-mermaid children. Uh, I don't know what they'd look like, really big legs, normal size, merfolk bodies, whatever, you get the picture. And so the giants, jock and nerd alike, were besotted and deceived by this nameless mermaid in a dynamic that could really only lead to trouble. The trouble started when Saxe stayed up late one night. He'd slept in that morning, and while he didn't tend to look at the sky, the aurora borealis at that time of year, at that time of day, was supposed to be particularly impressive. And when he did stay up so late, he saw across the firth, there, his love, singing out her songs to... to Herman. Saxe gave a mighty booming shout, booming for him, I mean, not his normal voice this. It shocked Herman. As the mermaid turned at it, she gave a bit of a cheeky oops, covered her mouth in false shock. Oh dear, naughty me. While Herman was, at first, just outright confused. So began an argument the sounds of which shook the hills and rocked the waves under those pretty dancing lights. Now if the mermaid had truly cared for them both, maybe she could have suggested some sort of thruple solution. I don't know. But she cared for Neva, so she splashed off to her rock at the end of the world and watched the little contest, as insults and boulders were thrown, the latter with a far greater degree of accuracy than had ever previously been the case. I imagine her eating popcorn and enjoying greatly the strife that she had wrought, ignored by the giants who focused their rage on each other, and through their angry words they both began to believe that the other was trying to steal their love away, not for a moment stopping and considering her agency. Eventually she must have got tired of this, boys, boys, all this fighting over little old me. They turned now to her, these two towering figures on their respective cliff tops, and still did not question her role. Not just enemies, but now rivals in love, their minds clouded to sense. A gal like me is sure lucky to have two big, strong, she indicated Saxy, sensitive, and Herman, guys fighting over her, but I don't want anyone to get hurt. Well, why don't you settle this in a peaceful way? What do you mean, my darling? asked Herman. My darling, shouted Saxe. Boys, boys, looky here. My home is the sea, yours is the land. If me and you, 
She indicated no one in particular at this line. If me and you are going to spend our whole lives together, well, I can come onto the rocks, yes, but I can't spend all my time there. You will have to join me in the water too. The hook was lodged now in their mouths. She, the bait. I would give up the dry land forever to have but a moment in the waves with you, came Herman's cry. (laughs) Ignore him, he could not stand the cold. My strong body would spend an eternity in the ocean with you. The mermaid smiled, inside and out. But that internal smile was a much crueler, darker one than the sweetness that graced her lips. Well, come into the water with me then. And she beckoned. Herman hesitated, looked across the firth to Saxe. The water was far down even for the giant and cold. Saxe looked back uncertainly at Herman. For a moment the two regarded each other suspiciously. Would they really go into the icy waters of the North Sea for her love? And then her voice came again. Boys, tell you what, whichever one of you reaches me first will be mine. And the sweetness of her voice and what it did to their giant brains and, well, their giant other bits, it spurred them into action. With two mighty splashes which covered the very cliff tops in waves, the giants were in the sea. With an affected giggle, the mermaid leapt into the air, turned and headed out towards Utska. Outstack, the point beyond which there is no more land, the edge of the world. All the waves beyond it belonged to the peoples of the ocean. When she reached it, she looked coy and giggled again and played with her green water-matted locks and said, Oh boys, and other signals of seductiveness that actually look really weird in reality. Beneath the celestial dancers, in the night sky, the greens and reds and purples of that dazzling light display, the giants swam. A breathtaking sight it must have been, and all the luminescent nighttime creatures of the waves fled hither and thither as the vast bulks of the giants cut through the water. They crossed to the rock in no time. They were, as giants of course are, big and strong, even the nerdy one. And it was a photo finish. And being no photos around at the time, no one was sure who had won. Not Herman, not Saxie, and not her. Though truth be told, she was barely paying attention. For as the two approached, she simply slipped off the rock back into the water swam on further out, remaining on the surface, above a vast body of water that was growing ever deeper. For a moment the two simping giants paused. Perhaps they even cast a glance back to the dark cliffs of Unst, a fleeting look at their home. But her call came again and they turned, looked over at one another with hatred, saw the woman they viewed only as a prize, and they dove on with swift, powerful strokes, out further and further away from land. And stroke for stroke they matched each other for a long time, and each time they got close to her the mermaid would turn and swim a little further out, and then a little further again. At times Herman would take the lead, at times Saxy, but she'd never wait around to declare any giant a winner. No, she'd splash away, tail in the air, swim even further out, spin her platitudes. Long after she couldn't see the land anymore, long after the dancers had disappeared from the sky and the first lights of a grey dawn beckoned on the horizon. There is, of course, no record of which giant stopped first. Earlier that night it would have meant everything to the quote-unquote winner to see their bitter enemy finally struggle to take a stroke more, but honestly... By the point one or other of these great rivals finally realised they weren't going to make it to her, competition was the last thing on their mind. There was barely anything in those minds by this point. Thoughts had been sucked out by the intensity of the race and the chill of the water as they got closer and closer to the Arctic Circle so that even their huge bodies felt the cold deep within. Teeth the size of gravestones chattered and all the while the mermaid beckoned on. 
but she noticed when the first giant stopped, frost beginning to form on his upper lip. She gave a much crueler laugh now as Herman, or was it Saxy, turned in the water, looked back for Unst, and even with those vast eyes, could make no sight of it. There was a manic delight in her cry when the giant started to swim back, back from where he had come, longing for his home. But still one of the giants made toward her, the victor, but she swam away from him still and then he wasn't swimming anymore. He was struggling, struggling to stay above the water. There was a desperate gurgling noise, a choking, as his head went under and he re-emerged. His eyes pleaded with her, asking why, why? But his trembling lips couldn't quite form the question. Salty water washed into his mouth. Her eyes opened wide with sadistic delight. Yes, yes. And she dived under the water into the calm of the ocean, so she could see better the giant's vain struggle to stay afloat could see better as one then the other two slipped beneath the waves, violently kicking and thrashing all the way, icy water filling their lungs. Their lust and their rivalry had carried them oh so far, with no thought of how they would return, and now, just as she had hoped, return they could not. This mermaid didn't make the mistake of another of her kind. She knew only too well that even lovers drown she watched as with a great painful struggle the life left their bodies and the two rivals sank down 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 to a watery grave down to where all the strange creatures of the deep dark recesses of the ocean live as strange as any being that legend or folklore has imagined those and they had a feast that would last for years perhaps the mermaid enjoyed a bit of a taste as well Any lessons, any morals that could have been learned from this about not fighting with your neighbour, perhaps about not romantically pursuing someone who isn't into you as you are into them, perhaps stopping and thinking before swimming out into the deep dark ocean, none of them had a chance to be learned by the giants. You may well ask why the mermaid did it. I have many theories, you may have some of your own. But there's no definitive answer. On the land, the giants maybe terrors, but it turns out that there are worse things at sea. Let us turn now to a place far further south. Now, one of the things about giants is that while they share the commonality of being like us but bigger, exactly how much bigger is incredibly varied. The term is sufficiently broad to incorporate beings from positively puny four or five metres tall, you know, giraffe size, all the way up to things with their heads in the clouds that could use skyscrapers as toothpicks. To classify them all as one type of creature under the category bigger than us, is quite a human-centric view. All giants were by no means alike. And I'm fairly sure that the giant of this next story would view Saxe and Herman as basically humans, given the disparity between his size and all of ours. Some give him a name, some do not. Those that give him a name call him Gwendol Rikin Abshenkin Abmuniv Mawa, But that strikes me somewhat as a name that's meant to sound like the name of a Welsh giant if it was named by English people who didn't like him very much. So make of that what you will. Named or not, his size was prodigious in the extreme. And in this tale of him, there are several elements that don't make a great deal of sense if you're trying to tie this folktale's proportions to the real world. 
scaling it all, working out what it means, trying to explain that to you has left me scratching my head. And while I normally love to make all the pieces of the folktales fit, I'm taking an unusual approach of abandoning all of that. I'm not expounding on any theories about how it could all neatly slot together. You're on your own for this one. Just know that for some elements of this story to be scaled correctly, this is a very, very, very big giant. More than mountain size. And for other elements of this story, well, not so much. The verisimilitude I care about so much was apparently not quite so respected by my forebearers in the storytelling trade. And having said my piece on this, I promise I will not call attention to it again. Make your own judgments. Now this giant was heading towards the town of Shrewsbury. Well, kind of heading towards. He couldn't have been coming from Wales, or if he was, he was taking a scenic, circuitous route across the farmlands and floodplain that surround that city. He hated Shrewsbury and its people. Why? Difficult to know. Perhaps he'd had a bad experience in Shrewsbury stepped on a church steeple like a piece of Lego and forever after harboured a grudge against the place. Though if that was the reason, well, he didn't actually know precisely where it was, and therefore I feel it's probably that he hated it from afar by reputation. What reputation Shrewsbury had to attract a giant's ire? An ire he didn't seem to feel about any of the other cities, or even humans in general? I don't know. Perhaps a Shrewsbury lad had climbed his beanstalk. Perhaps he'd read something in the giant equivalent of some tabloid rag, a football pitch-sized version of the Daily Mail printed with scurrilous lies about Shrewsbury folk. Whatever the reason, the giant had vowed revenge, for harms imaginary or real. But at our stories open, he is on his mission, striding across the landscape, which shakes under him as he walks, and he is weighed down by a shovel, its handle crafted, I assume, from whole forests of trees bound together, in a manner of manufacture I will not ruminate on too long. On the shovel was a huge, heavy lump of earth, a lump of earth he'd scooped up somewhere back in Wales, creating a massive lake. The plan was this. He would tip this earth into the River Severn, blocking up the river and so causing a flood that would drown the low-lying town as the river's banks rose. Shrewsbury would be no more. The pile of earth was of a size to be crawling with confused cows and sheep, in the same way that a more human-sized pile of earth might be crawling with earthworms and other displaced buglies. Now I think of it, this would also be crawling with earthworms, but they would have been less noticeable than the terrified livestock, confused, carried through the air atop the great mound of soil amongst unrooted trees. Now, our giant was already panting and puffing under the load, having walked all the way from Wales and somehow missed the Severn entirely, and you might reasonably ask, why didn't he just scoop up some earth closer to the river? And that would be a very good question. It could well be an indication that perhaps this was not the brightest of giants. Little bit of foreshadowing there for you. Anyway, he was at quite a loss about where exactly he needed to go. Where was Shrewsbury anyway? When who should he see but a human walking down the road towards him? That human was a cobbler, a mender of shoes. And from that man's point of view, the whole sky must have been filled with this giant. But to his credit, he didn't automatically flee in terror, didn't drop all the shoes he was carrying at the sight of this gravity-bending monstrosity, with its mountain-sized pile of earth precariously balanced on a spade the size of a city. The cobbler, just calmly enough, continued down the road, whistling a jaunty little tune. He had just been to Shrewsbury himself, and was now heading back to his little cottage with a whole load of shoes to repair, and when he was done, he'd take them back into the town. Typical cobbler behaviour. And he might well have passed the figure whose shadow turned day into night, had it not been for the giant, let's call him Gwendal, even if it's not his name, Gwendal, spotting him and calling out to the ant of a man rather politely, I say, can you tell me how far it is to Shrewsbury, my good man? <laughs> 
but in a way that was much more Welsh than that very English delivery I've just given, and his voice like a thunderclap somehow did not rend the eardrums of the cobbler until they were useless. Shrewsbury? asked the cobbler, his voice apparently perfectly audible to Gwendol's space telescope-sized ears. In this situation, many would have simply given the answer, and then got shot of Gwendol very fast indeed. But this cobbler was curious, and perhaps something about the whole situation struck him as a little odd, a little out of the ordinary. So he didn't just straight away answer the question, instead he said, So, just out of interest, why do you want to go to Shrewsbury? Ah, well, you see, said Gwendol, apparently happy someone was taking an interest. I've this here lump of earth, and he moved the shovel up and down to indicate it. A cow fell off, giving a low, mournful moo as it fell hundreds of metres and struck the ground with a sickening thud and an explosion of flesh. And I'm going to block up the River Severn with it, so the city will flood, and all those Shrewsburyans and that awful mayor of theirs will all be drowned. Volunteering the information without any thought to what the cobbler's opinion of it might be. So if you could tell me where it is, that'd be great, and then I can get that done and finally put this shovel down. The cobbler's mind raced on hearing this. The whole city to be flooded, everyone dead. Oh, how interesting, he stalled. Now, obviously he was concerned with the destruction of a whole city of people, the suffering, the death, all of that. Obviously, of course he was. But the thought that rose to the forefront of his mind was... Customers! The people of Shrewsbury were his customers. If they went, where was he going to get any more? A high-stakes situation indeed. His mind whirred, and suddenly, the canny cobbler came up with an idea. Ah, Shrewsbury, I know it well. You're actually on the right road. Thank goodness for that, boomed the giant. Yeah, but, oh, I wouldn't relax just yet. You see, I've just come from there, and I've worn out all these boots on the road from here to there. And he swung his sack off his back and opened it up to show boot after worn out boot. Boots that somehow the giant was able to perceive perfectly well without the need for a magnifying glass that would have fair cooked the man. That's a lot of boots. For extra effect, the cobbler upended the sack and boot after boot came tumbling out. Such a lot of shoes, he said. And Gwendol did not ask the cobbler why he was carrying all his worn-out shoes with him. Yeah, said the cobbler, it's a long journey. Judging by the size of you, you'll need a white cliff-sized Kendall mint cake for this one. Ugh. Gwendol slumped. Ugh, I'm tired already. I can't carry this much longer. Thought to revenge started to drain away now that this might actually be hard. And not once did he consider that he could just get a new spade full of earth closer to the city. Or, even if he believed the cobbler's story, he never once thought about the relative sizes between them and what this meant for the distance in question. No, instead he thanked the cobbler, dropped the earth where he stood. Best not to think too much about the fate of all those unfortunate cows. Then he scraped his boots on his spade and gave a big weary sigh. (sighs) Revenge wasn't worth the effort. And he turned, and back home he headed to Wales, presumably returning by the same indirect route that he'd taken to get there so that he didn't stumble on Shrewsbury by accident. And thanks to this load of old cobblers spouted by that old cobbler, town of Shrewsbury was saved, and Gwendol was never seen in England again. But his journey had made a lasting impact. For now, on that incredibly flat Salopian land, there was one huge out-of-place hill formed from the pile of earth that had come from that spade and a smaller one from the mud that came from the giant's boots.
the small mound became Urkel Hill, while that shovel load of earth is, of course, the Reekin, one of the most prominent features of the Shropshire landscape and a delight to walkers to this very day. Great views from the top if you ever get a chance to climb up with this giant shovelful. And now, ironically, given it was intended for the destruction of Shrewsbury, one of the most beloved and recognisable sites in Shropshire. What became of Gwendal and the Cobbler is a mystery, but I suspect both did all right for themselves. The Cobbler dined out on the story for years, and perhaps the giant even learned to hate the people of Shrewsbury a little less even if only because hatred is so tiring, even for giants. And that's the story of how the Reekin came to be, and how Shrewsbury was saved from a very tall giant by an even taller tail. Two stories down and now, now we're going to go back in time so that we can go forwards in time. Cast your mind back, oh, half an hour ago or so, when I was talking about the reassembly of the dead Gogmagog. He was but a day dead when the giant Gogmagog was already back. So what exactly is happening here? Well, listeners, speaking totally as me here, not an affected narrator type character, This is one of the most exciting stories I've ever discovered. I absolutely love the medieval myths about the first inhabitants of Britain that I've told you on previous podcasts, and I thought the story was good and done with the death of Gog Magog, but no, because you see, there is a medieval sequel, which is very much sequel material as we might understand it today as well. Okay, people, so we've killed off the main villain because we didn't know we were going to want a sequel, and we're definitely going to need giants, even though they're meant to have basically disappeared now, because... Well, giants are what drew people into the franchise. Also, we absolutely have to up our game here. What kind of ideas does anyone have about how we can make that all happen and ideally be even more over the top? As I touched on briefly, Gog and Magog and all the giants owed their origins to their incubi and human ancestors. For the forests of this land were once full of powerful spirits, and powerful, dangerous spirits had survived for all the ages of the giants and some inhabited the land still. And when the greatest of the giants met his end at the hands of the Trojans, was tossed into the waves, his body broken up, and when bits of it washed back onto the shore, one demonic spirit saw an unparalleled opportunity to do something incredibly cool. Into the body the spirit went, took possession of it, With diabolical energies, it pulled the battered body together, knitted flesh, reassembled it, until the demon was in full control of the mightiest form in the land, but now empowered anew with an infernal vitality that, if anything, made the body stronger than before. And rather than just a giant, there was now a demonic, undead, fire-breathing giant. Up there with Gremlins 2, perfect sequel material, guaranteed box office hit. And you might think the Trojans heading off to build their new Troy were in danger. But no. Possessed of this very corporeal form, the spirit didn't want to go and try its luck against the people who'd beaten the giants quite handily and had a giant of their own. It quite liked having a body, enjoying the pleasures of the flesh. So rather than do what might be considered the obvious thing, the hulking revenant instead made its way to somewhere more sheltered, remote, far away from where the only humans were heading. Perhaps it was a place the spirit had known itself. Up the southwest peninsula it strode, every moment enjoying the feel of the air and its skin, the wetness of the rain, the scent of the grass, and the taste of the infernal ash and fire in its throat, marvelling at all that a body gave it. At some point it crossed the Bristol Channel with ease, simply striding across in this giant form, 
and then into what would, many hundreds if not thousands of years later, become known as the Borderlands. The marcher lands between England and Wales, but was then undistinguished as such, as wild and unpopulated as the rest of the island. And it struck northwards, until eventually, not too far at all from the very flat plain where in centuries to come the easily bamboozled Gwendal would drop a mountain load of earth, the spirit found a place to set up a home. The exact area he started to inhabit is somewhat vague. A large territory, encompassing perhaps the southern end of the Clobidian Hills and lands to the south of it, stretching perhaps even as far as modern-day Shrewsbury. What's more important is what the spirit did next. For a change was coming for the giants of the land, those few survivors who persevered on despite the official chronicler's claim that all were defeated. By some means, and I'm not exactly clear how, but by some means, the spirit possessing Gogmagog let them know that here in this place, there would be a safe space for giants, away from Brutus and his ancestors. While the rest of the land might fall, this would remain giant country. Not exactly the all-out evil plan I thought this undead infernal monstrosity might go for, so much so that I find myself questioning whether the spirit was actually quite as evil as the stories make him out to be. Because despite not being a giant himself, in this form all he seemed to do was, well, good things for the giants. From then on, twice a year, the giants would come to that place, and there they would have what seems like a great time. They would worship a golden bull which could tell the future, Which makes sense, worshipping something that could tell the future. I get it. Pretty nifty as well. They would hold tournaments and jousts, there was feasting, no word on whether there was giant dance parties or orgies, but it sounds like it might have been that kind of vibe. There were other golden sculptures, because the giants liked gold, oxen and swans and peacocks, clearly some pretty talented giant artisans amongst them. No one seems to have cared that Gog Magog was undead, they were just happy to have a place that was safe. Because as time went on, the giants became more and more unsafe. As humanity spread out across the land and wherever it did, it came into conflict with giants. Even this little slice of paradise came under attack. King Bran, not I hasten to say the giant Bran from the Mabinogion, but a different human King Bran, He established a fortress right on the hill at the centre of this big, friendly giant community. It was a bold move from King Bran, and somehow or other he got enough time to establish a whole fortress there, dig a ditch around the place, move people in. Maybe undead Gog Magog was off, giving his biannual party invites out. But when he came back... Well... Then it was all over in short order. Down came the fortress of King Bran, smashed and charred. The invaders tried to bring the giant low, but soon found their bodies mangled and trodden underfoot. Unlike the Trojans, they did not have a giant on their side, and this all went very badly for them. From then on, it was in the ruins of King Bran's fortress, Dinas Bran, that Gog Magog dwelt atop the hill, surveying the land all around and defending this ruined fortress that had become his home from all comers. And for a long while the giants knew a peace of sort. Some balance was struck between them and the Britons. Later, the Romans, the Romans whose works would be mistaken for giants themselves, well, they largely left them alone and the giants did likewise. All across the islands, giants established or re-established themselves in the remoter, hard-to-reach places, there embarking, I suppose, on all the usual giant activities, gold and egg collecting, having wives who may or may not be giants themselves, it's sort of ambiguous, digging ditches, dropping rocks in the landscape. And they would all gather together, always under the fire-eyed watch of Gog Magog. Not exactly king, more like principal speaker, or simply MC. Twice a year parties whose size rivalled the giant's own in sheer gargantuanity. Things were okay. But of course they never remained so for long. The real problem came when Christianity arrived on the island. As I have said before at quite some length, with Christianity 
come the saints. Buffed up XP hungry adventurers with magical artifacts and blessings and a bigotry to all and any who do not immediately fall down in worshipful supplication to their blessed lord. People with a zeal for making sure that everyone knew that it was good news, not fake news, and if they thought otherwise, well, the saints had tools of persuasion, and if those didn't work, or even sometimes if they did, they had two tools of eradication. From one end of the country to the other, giants found themselves under unprovoked attack. Down in Cornwall, St. Dewey, or Twee, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, he apparently converted the giants to Christianity after beating their leader in a rock stacking competition by using the slightly dodgy, if you ask me, assistance of an angel. You may also note my scepticism as to converted there because records of what these giants did after they converted are thin on the ground almost as if they weren't converted at all. Up in Lewis, St Kieran didn't make any pretense. He demanded the giants built him a church, and when they didn't, he turned each and every one of them to stone. And there they stand to this day. Even just a short distance from Dinis Bran, a giantess was straight up murdered by St Colin, who was such a badass he just beat her in a straight up fight, even after she continued to hit him with her own dismembered arm. Which certainly shows resolve, but in the end she was just as harmless as you might expect. All across the land the giants cowered in fear at these murderous god-empowered humans, though it didn't help them that much as even giants hiding tend to stick out. But in Dinisbran, the undead Gog Magog, the last of the old giants and the first of the new, he held out. Even as St Augustine arrived from Italy, and spread the Pope's word throughout the people of the country, the demon that dwelt in that reanimated cadaver protected its little corner of the country, and twice a year the surviving giants still celebrated, their numbers fewer, every time. But after the first few waves of these invaders, When the saints had got the low-hanging fruit of the giants, and of course others they deemed monsters and infidels of all stripes, they slowed down. The giants that remained were the hardiest, the most remote or a combination of the two, and the power of the miracles granted seemed to wane slightly from the old glory days. But perhaps above all else they were distracted, for conflict between humanity raged across the land. Kingdoms of Britons versus Britons, yes, but then there was the coming of the Angles and the Saxons, and when they arrived they split into rival kingdoms that fell to fighting each other, and then there were other invaders, the Irish, the Norse, the Picts, the Jutes and the Danes, and that's not to mention the fierce inter-dynastic battles that raged between and within families for control of all of these sub-kingdoms. The power of the church was reduced, and those that remained powerful within it, the warrior bishops, were more keen to assist in battle against their fellow man than risk everything to take the word of Jesus to some battle-hardened, free-headed giant in a misbegotten, malaria-infested swamp somewhere. So there was another lull, a relative calm for a few hundred years or so. And the giants met still at Dinis Bran, played their games and looked at their gold animals, and had a community. These first children of Albion had endured terribly hard times before, and they would endure them again, and Gog Magog's unaccountable survival inspired them all. And listener, now is the bit where I must turn to what I suppose is the story of all of this. But honestly, I do not think it is. The story is the one I have told you already. The demon-possessed giant, first amongst equals, and the long, ongoing struggle of the giants to survive the coming of humanity, well after their time was meant to have passed if the Trojans were to have been believed. The story, such as it is, is that. This is just a footnote. The world changed again. Or at least the island of Britain did. The year was 1070-something. The previous decade, those who would, up until now at least, prove to be the final invaders of Britain, had arrived. And their conquest, unlikely as it had appeared, turned out to be more complete than many of those that had come before. Over the next few decades, the Normans would establish themselves as unchallenged overlords of England, and in the centuries after that, much of Wales too, changing the people, the country, the language forever. 
While the Normans were concerned mostly with subduing the human residents of their land, less well-known were their encounters with the inhuman, with the supernatural. Just as they tore up the existing political structures within the country with their vicious violence, so too did they upend the sort of balance that had come to be with the giants. Now, William the Conqueror had come to the Welsh borders as part of a bit of a tour of his new property, seeing the sights of the land. Naturally, as he made his way along the border, accompanied by his retinue, conversation turned to those areas that belonged to neither Welsh nor English. Well, actually, the locals might have tried to avoid talking about this, embarrassed by the presence of the giants on their land. But apart from being a murderous psychopath, William was also somewhat astute when people were trying to avoid a topic. Eventually, the whole story came out of how the giants occupied the place still in the ruins of the long-abandoned fort. And William the Conqueror listened. Now, one of the things about being not so much a strategic military genius as head of a band of risk-taking adrenaline junkie murderous thugs was that when danger reared its ugly head, there was always someone to shout out, Danger? I love a bit of danger. Bring it here, I'll nut it right in the face. Bite its balls off. Come on, bring it on, danger. And in this case, the boggle-eyed, crazed, fearless warrior in question was the king's own cousin. One of many, admittedly. Payne Peveril. That's P-A-Y-N, not P-A-I-N. But nevertheless, if you messed with him, you'd be on the pain train. P-A-I-N. Up he jumps. A giant? The most famous giant in English history? Let me at him. The harrowing of the North apparently having not quite sated his bloodlust. And they were away from the rest of the party. William the Bastard, as he didn't like to be called, decided that he'd sit this one out, but would encourage the pain train out of the station. Choo choo. So off sets Payne Peveril with 15 knights and, quote, other men-at-arms, which sounds oddly vague, like other men-at-arms could be anything from a couple of guys to right up to basically a small army. But anyway, however many of them there were, the next day they marched to the top of the giant's hill and stood around in the ruins of the castle the ill-fated King Bran had once constructed. They were brash and bold and full of courage that befits those who'd so recently ravaged the land and perhaps began to see themselves almost as gods in this place that had quite failed to resist them. But there were no signs of giants during the day, yet pain was not deterred. They would camp here, they would build fires and drink. But when the clouds gathered and the night drew in, their boisterousness lessened somewhat. For on the top of that exposed hill it was a foul night indeed. Fouler even than those Norman knights themselves. Not just pitch black, but soon a great wind started up, a screeching and a howling whipping around the decaying castle. The icy breath plucking out the flames of the fires with a brief surge of confetti embers dying in the air until the light was no more and the men could see nothing. A booming peal of thunder shook the mountains and there was a brief flash of lightning that revealed men huddling on the floor, fearful and cold. And then the rains came. Of course, as narrative demands, it was Payne Peveril who stood true against the elemental fury. As his companions near wept, he shouted into the face of the storm. Is that all you got? I've pissed directly into winds stronger than you before. But of course, the storm was merely the harbinger. The hills shook not just with the thunder, but with the footsteps of the giant. They echoed all around, though in that darkness the giant himself could not be seen. The earth rocked, men began to scream, and even pain was cast down to his feet. And it was at this point when he changed tack slightly, thought that maybe this was actually 
quite a lot more than he'd ever had to face before, and so, well, maybe, maybe he could ask a little help from the big man upstairs. Couldn't hurt, could it? As those footsteps got closer and closer, Payne gave a little prayer to God and to Mary, asked them to give him the power to strike down the evil that approached. And Jesus, God, Mary, those famed lovers of violence and murderers, well, they might just have been listening. For the cross, painted on Payne's shield, began to glow. There was another burst of lightning, and there he was where he had not been before, standing taller than the tallest of the ruined towers, the form of Gog Magog, greatest and oldest of the giants, and within his cadaver there dwelt the demon. The lightning disappeared, and it was dark, and that should have maybe been the end of it, but in an action which was as convenient for our protagonist as the choices made by many a modern-day computer boss in a fight scene, what Gog Magog did next worked to Peveril's advantage. For the giant hurled from his mouth a hellish fire, which conveniently lit up the whole of the hilltop. To his credit, Payne stood tall again, raised his sword confidently, and down came Gog Magog's hellish club. A club which was of a size that could realistically have been made from one very large tree, if you were wondering about the scale of this giant. Now that should have been enough to end the fight there and then, with the knight smeared across the wet grass. And it was not, I will have you understand, anything that the Norman knight did that saved him. No, it was simply him being in possession of a cross and having made that fervent prayer. Some celestial power saw Gog Magog and saw most of all the devil that dwelt within him. And it lent its divine aid. The holy light encasing Peveril in a heaven-sent cheat code. So while I wish I could narrate to you now an epic battle, a satisfying end to the centuries-long reign of undead Gog Magog, finally beaten by the cunning, strength or combination of the two by a worthy warrior after a long and arduous fight, I cannot. This was an unimpressive fight with God on one side. The fleshy form of the giant lost all its strength upon seeing the blessing that cloaked Peveril, and the demon turned to flee but the knight went after it, hitting it with his sword again and again, slashing at its legs until those gave way. Presumably he could only catch up with the demon because it was so hobbled by the power of the Lord, though exactly why capital he himself couldn't finish off the deed and down Gog Magog's possessor without pain is left unexplained. But it was at Payne's blade that he was felled, crashing to the earth on top of the hill, and as he fell the storm began to die down. Peveril did not strike the killing blow immediately, though. He was a curious sort, as well as a boisterous murderer, and the demon had a lot to say with his dying breath. Pretty much unprompted as it lay there, it spat out the story you've already heard, its history in possession of Gog Magog, which Peveril listened to with interest, but his attention really perked up when it started to tell all about the great treasures, all those statues made of gold, the peacocks and the horses, and of course the great golden bull that could tell the future. The invader's eyes lit up, in the kind of avaricious way that God no doubt approves of. Where's the treasure? he asked. Oh, don't you worry about that, came the raspy voice of the demon as it prepared to shrug off its cadaverous coil. For I have prophecies for you. You will become lord of this fiefdom after much strife and war, and from you there shall come a wolf with sharp teeth who will drive out the wild boar. Yes, yes, said Peveril, barely listening. That's very nice, but what about the treasure? And after that, there'll be a a leopard ramble on the demon, who it seemed suddenly had acquired the art of uttering ambiguous, potentially wildly misleading, maybe just false prophecies in its dying moments. Yes, but the treasure, where is it? Well, the wolf is going to live with the fishes, but eventually he'll subdue the leopard with his cunning and his artifice. 
came the raspy hell voice. The treasure! Do you want the pain train? The demon in possession of the body smiled. And having said its last possibly completely bullshit words, it died. Well, I say died. The demon form erupted out of the body with a horrifying stench that was half sulphurous fires of hell, half the now decaying body of a giant that should have died millennia ago. It was all that Peveril could do to stop himself being sick. And such was the final end of Gog Magog, after all those years. The next day, William the Conqueror arrived, instructed his men to throw that body into a deep pit, but the club was still to be preserved, to show its incredible size as a marvel, though that has long since disappeared. Those prophecies tell to pain Peveril may have come true, they may have not. It's difficult to tell with prophecies so ill-defined. But the treasures, the golden animals, they were never found. The ruins of Dinas Bran exist to this very day, and there is every chance that some were buried under those hills. The treasures are waiting to be rediscovered. For as long as anyone can remember, before the time of humanity, Albion was the home of giants. And while other giants still dwelt in Britain, there would be other giant stories to come. The regular meetings of the giants ended, along with the final death of that great leader of theirs, Gog Magog, undead, infernal, who at last got a much-deserved sequel that I'm pleased to have been able to share with you. The time of Albion's giants had passed. And there we have it. Only a very, very few of the many, many giant stories from Britain, one of the most popular types of story in British folklore. But I'm not going to talk about giants more generally now, I think, partly because I've got so many more stories to cover on that topic before I could give a realistic overview. Like, I've not even mentioned any of the jacks who kill giants here. And I've also picked stories that are somewhat atypical of giant stories, the Shrews, the Shrewsby one perhaps being the exception. So I will save a full giant overview for another time. And let's be honest here, this episode wasn't as much about giants as it was an excuse for me to tell you the sequel to the Trojan, Giant and Albina stories. So let's start with discussing that story. So the original story of the Trojans led by Brutus, not that Brutus, coming to Britain that I told way back when, was originally written or written down, but probably just plain written, by Geoffrey of Monmouth in the 1130s. That's Geoffrey of Monmouth, podcast's favourite embellisher of the truth slash outright fraudster. That story features the battle with Gog Magog, who isn't actually quite the last of the giants, but is the most ferocious and their leader, and that story ends with saying that the rest of them disappear off into caves and the like. That story of Brutus then got picked up and reworked many, many times throughout the medieval period. It was a very popular story. It obviously spawned the story of Albina as a prequel to it, which I love so much. And there were other prequels as well, some featuring an Albina character as the origin of giants. But in other cases, for instance, Albina was, rather than the justified murder princess we all know, a giant descended from Poseidon himself. Interestingly, Geoffrey's story itself is kind of a sequel to the Aeneid by Roman writer Virgil, or at least set within the same mythological universe, which obviously Geoffrey was claiming was the real universe, but, well, I've got my doubts. That was a sequel, and then this story about Gog Magog I told you today is a sequel to Geoffrey's story. Today, when we discuss sequels and the like, it's very clear where they fit, especially in the canon, you know, those of which are simple fan fiction and those of which are part of the established universe. But back in those barbaric times, people just wrote their own stuff down using characters and settings and creations, which were in the general cultural milieu. Um, why have I gone down this rabbit? Why have I gone down this rabbit hole? I suppose I just like drawing the parallels to various different medieval authors writing fan fiction of their favourite stories without any of the limitations people have today. Anyway, back to this tale. It originally appears in a 
Roman Sufuk Le Fitzwarren. I am not sure I'm pronouncing that first name right there. Romance here being a bit of a misleading term because the modern English usage of the term romance, really romance is more like a medieval novel than anything else, typically focusing on adventure and night with a little bit of love often thrown in, rather than what we mean by romance today. The Romance of Folk the Fitzwarren is a much longer piece of work, which was written about an actual guy called, well, Folk Fitzwarren, or possibly about a couple of actual guys called Folk Fitzwarren, confusingly, but it's basically fiction. The written version we have comes from the 1300s, well after the real Folk the Fitzwarren, or the multiple people who inspired him existed, and it's a much longer story about this knight who is a bit of an outlaw, but in a good way, and he travels around a lot. It has adventures in Orkney, Spain, Windsor, and Wales and Shropshire. Interestingly, it's been theorised that a character in this romance gave rise to the character of Maid Marian. Didn't really look into how accurate that was, but, but found it an interesting little tidbit. Anyway, the bit that concerns us is just a small prologue to this tale that tells of Payne, Peveril and Gogmagog, which I told you fairly straight. Though the text itself leans much more on a Christianity angle, and is much more explicit about the demon being, well, evil and terrible and sent by the forces of hell, and that's why it's obviously so vulnerable to just the sight of the cross. This happens a lot in medieval tales, and honestly, I just find it not a very satisfying storytelling technique. Literal deus ex machina is pretty dull. There's not really a whole deal of danger here for any heroes. Now, whether the story of Gog Magog and Payne Peveril was written for this romance, or whether it pre-existed it, is up for debate. But as far as I can tell, which isn't a lot on this one, there's not a lot to go on really, there is a possibility that this legend was taken from a pre-existing legend about Payne Peveril and a giant local to the area, which probably wasn't Gog Magog, who was kind of inserted in the story afterwards to make it into that cool sequel material. But there's not a lot of certainty on this really. Payne, by the way, was also a real person, or the Peverils were certainly Norman knights who came over with William the Conqueror and were granted lands. There's even a Peveril castle to this very day. And in yet another odd connection with the Robin Hood legend, William Peveril was actually the first Sheriff of Nottingham a few decades after the conquest. So yes, we don't know a huge amount here. Could, could potentially have been a local story that was just inserted at the start of this romance to give it a local character or invented entirely for it. I know I've said it before during the episode, but once again, I really do think this tale, however it emerged, shows such a recognisable element of the kind of filmic storytelling we're used to today, with its resurrection of a character and making them even worse than before. Giant and demonic and undead. It's so over the top, and I love it. To me, this is one of those stories that feels ultra-modern, at least in its conception, if not the delivery, but hopefully I've managed to deliver a more modern take on it. Now, I only discovered this story very recently, but oddly enough, I did go to the ruins of Dinas Bran as a child a couple of times. It's in a bit of a tourist hotspot, and I think I vaguely remember a giant being associated with it, but years later when I got obsessed with the founding of Britain stories, I hadn't put that together with my old favourite Gog Magog. Dinas Bran itself is a fortress with a long history. It sits atop a prominent hill. Bran here doesn't actually seem to refer to a king, but to crows. Bran meaning crow in Welsh, possibly called Dinas Bran because of its prominent and lofty position, though the origin of the name, and even if it does actually refer to the Welsh crow, is the subject of lengthy scholarly debates I can't really have an opinion on. But it's been there for a long time, there was an Iron Age fortress there, and several more fortresses since. The current picturesque ruins atop the hill are of a castle built around the 1260s, and which was left to fall into dilapidation shortly thereafter, producing this very pleasing sight to visit. Thoroughly recommend it. Now, Dennis Brown has been associated with this legend for some time, but a bit of a kicker here is that Dennis Brown, the fortress and hill we know today, might not actually be the same thing that's been referred to in the Romans of Folk Le Fitzwarren. A few other places have been suggested. The descriptions don't match up the Roman city of Uriconium near modern-day Roxeter, which is the right general area as well, has also been suggested as another fortress of King Bran that might be being referred to in the tale. 
It's all a bit unclear, but I stuck with a much more simple, these two places are definitely the same, because that's what most modern tellings make of it, and it just makes more narrative sense. So there we have it, a medieval fiction which could have its origin in an earlier legend, giants as a myth are very old, so it's just possible that there was an early legend about the giant in the area that wasn't undead demonic gogmagog, even though that is most definitely an upgrade. So, moving on to the Saxe Herman story, that is something completely different. While the Gogmagog sequel dates back at least 700 odd years, when it comes to Saxe and Herman, the origin of this story involves, you guessed it, a 19th century folklorist, and a particularly interesting folklorist who has achieved a reasonable amount of fame by the standards of 19th century folklorists on the internet in the last few years. Though, that's not exactly a lot of fame, but you know, comparatively. Even though I've not discussed it before, I think there's a good chance many of you will be aware of another legend that she told. The folklorist is Jessie Saxby, a very interesting figure hailing from Shetland. She lived a good long life between 1842 and 1940, and was a prolific author and poet, a writer particularly for children, especially boys, achieving a reasonable amount of fame in her day, supporting herself through her writing after her husband passed away. She came from the Edmonston family, a prominent Shetland family, one of her brothers being a famous botanist, and in fact I've already told you stories taken from a book that she wrote with a different brother covering the folklore and social life in Shetland. That was for the Trow's Christmas episode. But like many 19th century folklorists, what in her work constitutes completely original fiction and what was collected or came from earlier stories is difficult to pass apart. You might well know her because she is the source of the Wolver, a story which the internet went a little mad for a few years back, for good reason. The Wolver is a wolf-headed creature, often incorrectly called a werewolf online, but it simply has the head of a wolf with a human body. And rather than being aggressive, it caught fish in Shetland, sat on a little rock, just catching fish, being peaceable. And it's particularly noted because the wolver would leave fish on the windowsills of poor people's home if they were particularly struggling. And it's this characteristic that really caught people's imagination and what's made the creature so well loved today. Jessie Saxby also loved the wolver, even named her house after the wolver. And she also invented the wolver. And this isn't one of those cases like John Roby I've discussed so much before, where there was some earlier folklore that passed through her hands and she just sort of changed it around a bit. No, she made it up. Shetland Museum and Archives has a piece on this online, which I've linked to on the website, and it does not hold back. It calls Saxby the villain of the piece, though I don't think that is her judgement about her as a person, merely in this particular the article explains that there are lots of place names in Shetland with a prefix wall, W-O-L, but they sound a bit like wolf, but that name actually means fairy. But that wasn't good enough for Saxby. Those place names inspired her, and so she created the Wolver to explain them. Shetland museums are unambiguous about this. I'm name dropping them not just because they did the research, but also because, as a person not from Shetland, I don't want people coming at me for trying to denigrate the tradition there. This is pretty unambiguous stuff. Quote, Jesse was the sole creator of the Shetland Wolver. No one before Jesse had ever heard of a Shetland Wolfman. Unquote. Which, of course, doesn't mean the Wolver's not a big thing today. It absolutely is. It just didn't exist before about 1930. Now I say all this to then come back to the story of Herman and Saxe, which, by the way, is an absolute favourite story of mine. I'm a bit of a sucker for stories of women fighting back against men triumphantly generally, and this one has so many little details and is so vicious and violent, an aspect I also enjoy in stories. And it also has a rare aspect I also kind of like in stories where there are no humans involved at all, which is pretty unusual. There is something just very appealing to me about a mermaid who drowns big strong giants who are just obsessed with her in that very stereotypically masculine way where they just aren't interested in anything about her at all. You know, whether she's a ruthless sadistic killer, for instance. Could have sorted that out with a few first date questions. It's a very strong story structure, and for that reason it's a very popular story today. You'll find it very easily on the top folklore stories about Shetland on the web, and of course particularly about Unst. 
and the links to Herman S and Saxevoord, real places on Unst, make it one that's linked intimately to the island. Onomastic explanations are something that people like in their local folklore. That's the explanation of where the names come from. These places are named after these giants, and here's a cool tale about them. Which is all great, but this story comes from the same Jesse Saxby who straight up made up the wolver. What are the origins of this story? Well, every source I've seen has Saxby at its heart. This story, as I've told it, doesn't appear until quite late, in a 1932 work called Shetland Traditional Law, the same one which the wolver appears in, actually. Now, I've actually not been able to track down a copy of that work, but I've instead told this story from the various internet retellings and from Jesse Saxby's earlier 1876 work, Dala Mist. Dala being a word for the mist that gathers in the valleys at night. Very poetical. She's got a hell of a way with words, does Saxby. This Dala Mist volume is presented as a collection of stories from Shetland, but there isn't any academic type introduction to where they come from or the like, just completely absent. All the stories are written in a style that's not typical of folk stories as they were originally told, a literary style, as I suppose you might expect from a highly prolific and talented children's author. That itself doesn't mean that they weren't earlier stories slightly reworked. And in that volume, Herman and Saxe do appear in a story along with a mermaid. And Jessie says of the story that she tells there, Quote, I have simply, and with the implicit faith of one descended from Norsemen, told the facts of the story. Unquote. This is presented as an old story. But that tale is somewhat different from the one I've just told and the one that was in the 1932 work. While Herman and Saxe fall in love with the mermaid, there is no luring of the giants to their death. They fight over her, yes, but oddly enough, a witch then appears out of basically nowhere, a witch who hates the giants, and quote, they could only fall under her spells when in the toils of their evil passions, unquote. And so now the two giants are fighting each other, they can fall under her spells, and she uses them straight away, kills the two of them, turning Herman into the mist that lingers above Hermaness, and Saxe's body becomes the hill Saxevord. This version of the giant story, while it's not perhaps as satisfying narratively, feels a bit more like a usual folk narrative, with its very direct etiological angle. That's how things came to be. The names of Saxevord and Hermaness are very clearly explained through this tale, but also their appearance in the landscape. I can't find anywhere else to get this in, but I should just mention that in that story, Saxby uses the phrase piscatorial coquette to describe the mermaid, which is absolutely perfect. Anyway, to me, the fact that this much earlier story is different doesn't give much confidence in the 1932 version being a real old story. It feels like Saxby has developed this idea of the mermaid and the giants in the 60 years between writing these two accounts. Whether or not there was any story that predates her to begin with is not quite clear. Now, Herman and Saxe also show up in that book I mentioned, which Saxby wrote with her brother. And that's not a storybook, but a book on folklore slash growing up in Shetland that mentions a few of the giants of Unst, a female one, for instance, that I haven't told the story of. Now, this is a much shorter reference. And while it mentions the giants, it doesn't mention a mermaid at all. Just gives accounts of how various things, the kettle, boulders thrown, aspects of the different geology, are said to be down to the giants fighting. But there is one earlier mention of these giants. It's in a book written by Jesse Saxby's mother, and that account is even shorter. It basically just says that there's a rock in the middle of the firth that divides the two headlands that was thrown by one of the giants, and that's it. That's the earliest reference I've got, and it's a very simple tale at that point. And crucially, once again, there's no mermaid to be seen. So I can't definitely conclude anything here, but I think the most likely explanation is that there may well have been local stories about fighting giants called Herman and Saxe. I can't say that for certain, but it does seem almost certain that everything else was the invention of Jesse Saxby. And if that's the case, then she's given us an absolutely fantastic tale, which I love to tell to you, and which is very much still told about Unst to this day. So let's turn finally now to Gwendol and the Reekin, the story of the cunning cobbler. 
Okay, this is an interesting one. Firstly, let's start with looking at the broader picture. A story along these lines, that is, that a giant supernatural being is going to destroy somewhere, a cobbler shows them lots of shoes and says that's how long it took to walk from there, and they go home, crops up in quite a number of places within a few hundred miles of Shropshire, as far remote as Anglesey and Wiltshire, for instance. There are various variants around the theme, but it usually explains some local landmark, a big rock if not a hill, though I would say that the reconversion is almost certainly the most famous telling of the story. Renowned modern folklorist Jeremy Hart writes about this story at some length in his excellent book Cloven Country, The Devil and the English Landscape, which might clue you into the fact that the biggest difference between these variants is that the story is sometimes told not of a giant, but about the devil, who is equally huge, and who is prone to being outwitted by crafty cobblers and indeed tradespeople, and those with no trade more generally. And Hart quotes a source from the 1880s that says that the story was originally told about giants, but younger people, they said it was the work of the devil. Hart examines this story and its variants in some detail, and is about as definite as a folklorist can be, when he says that while there are certainly long traditions of people outwitting stupid giants, personally I think of the brave little tailor, a wonderful story, this particular story with the cobbler and everything seems to have cropped up and then spread somewhere in the border region of Wales, between the mid-18th century and the end of the 19th century, firstly being about a giant, and then becoming about a devil. The version with the Recon in has stuck more firmly to the giant version, which Hart puts down to the fact that the Recon story was recorded by folklorist Charlotte Byrne, who wrote a very influential book of Shropshire folklore called Shropshire Folklore, A Sheaf of Gleanings, I do love these names, which features the giant version rather than the devil version, and that following her, most of the versions of the tale told were about a giant. Interestingly, Charlotte Burns also includes a completely different giant story about the origins of the Recon, with two giants fighting each other, but it's that story of the cobbler that's really stuck in people's imagination. Charlotte Burns' version wasn't the first written down. Back in 1860, Thomas Wright, an antiquarian, had an article in the Journal of British Archaeology about the local legends of Shropshire, which feature this tale very prominently. And he writes about how this legend ties back to Germanic legends and mythology. The giants of Jotunheim get a mention. And in his mind, the giant is definitely Thor in some early version of this story that's been around for centuries and centuries. An interpretation that is, to say the least, debated today. Because, as Jeremy Hart has shown, just because a folk story sounds like it should be very, very old indeed, doesn't mean it necessarily was. And as many modern folklorists have shown, folk tales continued to be generated throughout the ages, including up to our very own age with, you know, people like Jesse Saxby. The thing is, there's clearly a lot of versions of the Recon story flying around, not just to do with the other hills that it could be about, but the Recon itself. People like to emphasise different bits of the story. In Wright's version, he actually explains the reason why the giant wants to go to Shrewsbury in the first place. It's that he eats people, that he's run out and he's asked the people of Shrewsbury to supply him with young maidens to eat. And they and their mare refuse. While in Charlotte Byrne's version, like my own, it's simply hand-waved away with the phrase, for some reason or another. I'm not quite sure when, but at some point, the amazing and very silly Gwendol Riechen ap Schenken ap Munifmauer name cropped up, and that name has stuck to this day. As local legends go, I think this is a very well-known one. It's very simple, it's silly, funny, and about a very famous landmark. And I'm fairly sure that generations of parents have told it to their children, and that continues to this very day. It's just a great little story to entertain the kids with as you drive on past. A proper local folk story with staying power, this one. And I think that's about it. That brings me to the end of this discussion section. I didn't mention fee-fi-fo-fum once. Go back to the Child Roland episode if you want more on that. And that's it from me for now. I am still continuing this podcast. I know I've not been doing them as regularly. And I'm also going to do some more live shows soonish as well. Watch my socials for that. No lengthy outro, just to give a massive thank you to all my patrons who are actually going to get something. You only ever pay when you get something, so don't worry. But they're going to get a patron episode about a giant story, which is currently in the works.
Thank you this time especially to Peter O'Connor, Grace Tuttle, Amina Amcha Rahman, Elaine and Embroidered Yeti who have signed up since the last episode and will be getting a new members episode very soon. You can join today and get all the episodes that are up there now for free. Next episode, I think I've definitely had enough of multiple story episodes that always take a little bit more time to research. I'm differing between a couple of stories, but I think we'll be either back to Ireland for a story featuring a black-handled knife, but if not, we'll be doing a Scottish fairy tale with an unusual resolution. Those will certainly be the next couple of episodes anyway. Thank you all so much once again for listening, and I'll see you again after hopefully not too long. You can follow Tales of Britain and Ireland podcast on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's also a website, talesofbritainandireland.com, where there's a page for each episode which contains more information including illustrations, asides and recaps, along with other additional bits and pieces to explore. The intro music was written and performed by Alice Nichols, and the outro music by Mitch Keeley and Josh Newman. And you can find all the other musical credits on the episode page on the website. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please do share it with others or give it a review, as those really are the best ways to help us out. You can also join Tales of Britain and Ireland on Patreon to get extra members' episodes. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join me again soon. (laughs) 